good afternoon again. Uh, so today we have our uh, third uh, Eximius Symposium uh, on immune differentiation linked to age uh, and exposure. I try to share uh, this session. Uh, I'm Peter Hood uh, and um, the PI of uh, the Eximius uh, project, which is a uh, Exposome project, but I will come to that uh, in a few minutes later, or in a minute later. So, in Europe, since two years, two years and a half almost, uh, we have uh, nine uh, human exposome uh, projects, large uh, projects sponsored by the EU, uh, and they are all. Um, indicated here. So athlete, E4, Equalife, Eximius, Expanse, Redeemer, Longitools, uh, Human Exposome, and Hedim, Met. Um, so so in, in Eximius project, in, as you can see in the scheme, we try to look uh, in the interaction in between the external exposome, which could be different uh, external factors, which are environment, um, pollution, as well as your uh, individual occupation and so on, and, and the internal exposome, uh, the, the molecular changes, which would include uh, transcriptomic epigenomic changes, but we want to mainly focus on the immune changes that mediate the communication. So uh, this is funded under the Horizon 2020 and, and runs up to the end of 24. And we are 15 partners from seven different countries working in the framework of European Human Exposome Network, as Professor Hood mentioned. And um, so it's uh, then we start with the presentation. I think Professor Stoker will be the first speaker to this afternoon. The next speaker uh, is uh, Joan Aguirre. Willera, sorry, uh, from Stanford University. He has uh, different uh, appointments, as you can see, uh, uh, Director of Translation, Environmental and Climate Health uh, at C. N. Parker uh, Center uh, for Allergy and Asthma. And he has uh, a PhD from uh, the University of, of El Paco uh, in, in, in Texas, and he's interest is mainly in the impact of climate change, wildfire, air pollution, immune health of children, pregnant women, and firefighters. So please, uh, John, uh, please uh, share your uh, slides. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much for the introduction, Peter. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you very well. Excellent. Let me start uh, sharing my screen and hopefully I would assume you can see my slides. So thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to share a little bit uh, about the things that we're passionate about, specifically talking about the immune changes. And we're going to be discussing a little bit about how we have uh, the effects of the immune system being done by climate change and air pollution. So to give you a little bit of an outline of the presentation for today, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about the health effects and the background while we discuss a little bit of uh, what we have done in regards to ambient air pollution, uh, specifically a couple of studies that have been looking at uh, pregnancy, uh, studies in children, and also some of the work we've done related to wildfire, smoke exposure, and of course, the solutions uh, facing research and policy outcomes we need to consider, especially uh, given the nature of the topics. And, and of course, uh, uh, the wonderful work that all our collaborators are doing. Uh, I think it's very important to stress out, uh, especially what is the challenges we're currently facing on the effects of air pollution particles inside the body. I think this is a great segue to what uh, Tobias mentioned in his presentation. And I mean, what you can see or smell could harm you. And in this regards, uh, the small particles that are present in pollution are gonna be going through our body. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of overlap with what Tobias already mentioned, how these particles are gonna affect uh, the respiratory system. And let me make sure that the screen is sharing. Uh, 
because it told me that it stopped. So I'm going to restart again, just a little bit. I apologize for that. So do you see the current slide on the effects of air pollution, I assume? Well, it's not a complete slide, but it's a, it's a scheme that we see from Wu 2018, if, if that's correct. It should be. Mm, let me double check just uh, why it's not uh, moving along as, as it should. I think it's just trying to share the presentation. There we go. My apologies for that. I don't know why it's doing this. It's usually not like. Sorry to the attendees. I, I think it's a day of glitches, but we can live with that as long as we can have a discussion. Definitely, and, and sorry for for that. Um, not at all. I don't, know, I don't know why it's it's not showing me the presentation currently in my screen, and I can go through it. Okay, I'll start again. I will have to restart my PowerPoint. Sorry for that. I think the application just crashed, and that was the reason why it wasn't showing. But as I was mentioning, uh, the health effects uh, of air pollution are going to be omnipresent. And in this regard, uh, we're going to start seeing. Uh, I got my slide back here. There we go. Yep, we see your slide. It's the first slide. Um, yeah. Perfect. And yeah, we're back to working. the effects of air pollution, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for that. I think just PowerPoint crashed. And, and that was a reason why I couldn't go back to it. But going back to this, uh, we're also concerned about the smaller particles going into the deep uh, ends of uh, the respiratory system. And in this case, the translocational particles are going to go into the circulation, also causing systemic oxidative stress and systemic inflammation, which is going to lead also to cardiovascular effects. And we also see that there are some effects in the autonomic nerve system that's going to lead to arrhythmias, uh, decreasing heart rate variability, and uh, vasoconstriction. So all of that it's a combination of effects that are going to be uh, very concerning, specifically for vulnerable populations. Uh, uh, current review, I mean, show that for pregnant women and children that are less than five years old, they're living in areas which exceed the World Health Organization PN 2.5 levels. So these are particles that are smaller than uh, 2.5 micrometers. And you're going to notice that most of the areas in blue are going to have a uh, great number of uh, women and children exposed to the high levels of pollution. And I mean, when we look at the uh, reviews that consider the environmental pollutants and the immune response, uh, it goes very deep into even looking at some of the receptors and how some uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptors are going to be interacting uh, by the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And these are going to induce the expression of certain markers like FOXP3, IL-10, that are going to affect T cell progenitors, T regulatory cells, TR1s, which are going to be leading to immunosuppression. But also, uh, there's going to be an effect on Th17 cells that also lead to a state of hypersensitization and autoimmunity, while also leading to uh, other mechanisms that are going to go into atopic disease. So it's a very complex interaction where we not only see this immune suppressed state, but also this hypersensitivity reaction, given that the particles penetrate deeper into the system. And of course, the environmental pollutants associated with immune disease go far deeper. Uh, we can go into considering dioxin, benzopyrenes, uh, metals like cadmium, arsenic, mercury, and lead uh, have all been linked uh, in one way or another in human and animal studies to the immune system change. And these exposures can also lead to epigenetic changes and inflammation. I mean, when we consider the exposure to, for example, diesel exhaust particles, uh, there's going to be a stimulation in alveolar macrophages, as Tobias mentioned. There's going to be a lot of interactions within the epithelium. But these also serve as allergens that are going to be uh, inducing an inflammatory response, also leading to expression of Th17 cells. 
which is also going to be related to 1011 translocation and DNA methyl transferases that are going to be leading to uh, CPG methylation of gene expressions of, of genes that are related uh, to pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory responses, which is going to also be leading to uh, changes in the long term. And in this sense, uh, when we notice uh, some of the DNA methylation uh, studies that have been looking into the immune system, there are a lot of elements that uh, we can focus on, uh, specifically related to pollution. Uh, there's several studies that have been focused on the immune response. And for example, we've seen uh, a lot of links with uh, FOXP3, interferon gamma, IL-10, IL-1 receptor 2. And in this sense, it's very important to consider how all these interactions are going to be affecting the immune system, given the exposure to several air pollutants. So we did a study uh, related to pregnancy, uh, just because we know that uh, associations to ambient air pollutants uh, are going to be related to outcomes such as preeclampsia, preteen labor, and low birth weight. But also during pregnancy, we have a very dynamic system where we're gonna see several interactions, specifically in the second trimester. Uh, pregnancy is a very uh, unique state uh, as far as the immune response, because uh, even though we have an anti-inflammatory environment where uh, the mother is getting ready to uh, nurture uh, the developing fetus and eventually uh, the baby, there's also a pro-inflammatory environment that's uh, mainly heightened early in the pregnancy and also during the delivery phase. So we are going to see that there is a, a lot of combination of pro and anti-inflammatory responses, and those both have been linked to the effects of air pollution exposure, uh, specifically also when considering epigenetics. Uh, we need to consider the highlights of the alterations uh, during pregnancy and childhood. And we're currently are doing a proposed immune system study where we're going to be looking at different immune subsets to notice identity and faction of uh, different immune cell populations, validate and identify epigenetic mechanisms during immune dysfunction, and also map the T cell receptor diversity of the immune dysfunction. Because we know that this attenuation in cell mediary uh, response shifts from Th1 cells to Th2 uh, cells, which is basically what I mentioned going from this uh, an anti inflammatory, pro inflammatory, then anti inflammatory response, where the different uh, populations of Th cells are going to be leading also to the uh, production of very different cytokines that are going to be affecting uh, the immune state uh, during pregnancy. So uh, we studied about 200 women uh, from Fresno and the uh, uh, Lower Valley of California, which is an area that's uh, considerably important for us because they are exposed year round to very high levels of air pollution exposure. And we were able to estimate uh, the mean concentrations for several air pollutants listed here. Uh, and then the exposure levels from one week, uh, one month, three and six months concentrations. And what were the effects on particulate matter PM10 uh, specifically prior each sample collection? Uh, I won't go uh, into much detail about all the findings, but some examples listed here is, for example, when we notice the relationships of IL-10, we would notice that as some of the air pollution exposure increases, we also see the effects of these air pollutants increasing and having a direct effect. In this case, we consider the methylation of several GCPG sites uh, that express IL-10 in this case, but also we consider IL-4 and interferon gamma and FOXP3 while also noticing uh, the frequency of the TH uh, cells. In this case, we list the TH17 cell frequencies that were decreased as the air pollution levels uh, tended to increase, where in summary, we noticed that these methylation levels in IL-4, IL-10, and interferon gamma were associated with the exposure to air pollutants. But at the same time, the percent of TH1, TH2, and TH17 cells were negatively associated with several air pollutants, which offer insights into the detrimental air pollution effects during pregnancy and the need for more epigenetic studies. In this sense, we also uh, consider children uh, from the same area, and this was done in the Central Valley as well. And something 
thing that's very interesting about the Central Valley in California is that it's an area where you see a lot of exposure due to wildfire smoke, uh, due to traffic. And since located in an area that's within a basin, the air pollutants tend to just be stagnant uh, in this area. And that's why we see that general air pollution metrics are, are very high uh, for the people living in these communities. Uh, the most frequent uh, semi-volatile compounds found in this area are usually the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in Fresno. And for this other study, uh, we consider about a thousand individuals where we've got very robust data uh, considering their lung function, their health habits, uh, samples to measure uh, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and microbiome, and also their plasma and PBMCs, which uh, we have been studying uh, for the last couple of years, where we consider in high dimensional uh, omics like cytop, proteomics, epigenetics, apex seq and uh, single cell transcriptomics. Uh, some of the interesting links we have found is that the exposure uh, to several other pollutants, in this case, nitric dioxide, carbon monoxide, and PM3.5, has been linked to DNA methylation differences in FOXP3 uh, cells. And in this regard, we notice that there has been some seasonal variations, but also as the amount of air pollution exposure increases uh, with each passing day, we tend to see higher levels of FOXP3 methylation. So the higher the exposure, the larger the amount of changes we start to see in several of the, uh, of the markers. And also when considering the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the exposure associated with changes in FOXP3 methylations is greater in children that are uh, uh, asthmatic when compared with children that uh, do not suffer from, from asthma. And of course, uh, these uh, changes tend to be sustained over time. We had a subset uh, uh, that we were able to follow up through a, a longer period. And we noticed that some of these uh, CPG methylation changes uh, tend to be similar, even when considering a visit day that is going to be almost within a year. So I think it's very important to consider that it's not only the short term effects that are going to be inducing changes but also the long-term exposure has gonna be posing an increased risks. And uh, other research have looked that, for example, exposures to uh, phenytrines is gonna be inducing uh, the presence of other cytokines, in this case also IL-4, PSTAT-6, JTA-3, and IL-13. I think it's very interesting that as the exposure continues to be uh, present within a certain number of days, we're gonna see that there's going to be increases. And in these changes, we can notice that some of the trends here tend to increase when compared. Uh, uh, studies have looked at some uh, uh, participants that are exposed to phenytrine and samples that are just uh, diluted. So we're considering air pollution associated immune modulation and other diseases. Uh, it is another study uh, we were able to do in the similar area. Uh, we did. Uh, the representation of cytop data, which is uh, as, uh, an element that considers the mass cytometry of the cells, in order to see some of the cell associated signatures of air pollution, oxidative stress, inflammation, and the inflammasome activity. And in this study in particular, we noticed that with the higher exposure to PM2.5 PM levels, we tended to see an increased accumulation of circulating monocytes uh, when we compare paired them visually in the Disney plots, with also leading changes in uh, milliperoxidases, increased levels of C-reactive protein, higher levels of IL-1 beta levels. And we notice that these clusters tend to associate and be presently higher uh, as the levels of air pollution tend to increase. So in a summary from this work, uh, the monocytes seem to be linked with air pollution associated and also uh, with blood pressure increases in adolescents. Uh, this was part of another collective study where we're looking into uh, children uh, that were adolescents, but also from the same area, where the indirect effects that are gonna be coming from the different air pollutants are gonna also lead, lead to this uh, higher response in monocytes, which could also have a cardiovascular effects. And in this case, we saw the associations uh, with the diastolic uh, blood pressure.
And in a similar case, the PM2.5 pollutant exposure is going to be uh, related to TH2 loci and DNA uh, CPG site methylations of immuno immunoregulatory genes and exposures. And we can see that this response is present in a lot of CPG sites, and it's related to several uh, genes that are going to be the uh, carry on the expressions of IL-4, IL-10, interferon gamma, and FOXP3. So uh, this is going to be leading to these associations being also a uh, change that is going to lead to a pro-inflammatory response with interference also of anti-inflammatory responses. And the most interesting thing is that these changes tend to be sustained over time. So if the exposure tends to increase and people are exposed uh, three months, six months to high levels of air pollution, we tend to see a greater effect in the DNA methylation of some of these sites. But also, what are we seeing now with climate change and what it's uh, gonna be the relationship with air pollution and the immune system? Well, currently with wildfires, there are no boundaries and we've seen that with increased temperatures uh, the wildfire season has been present uh, for longer periods and it's also gonna be uh, widely extended uh, throughout different areas in the world. So uh, the hottest years uh, have been breaking records every time and we start to see that these changes are gonna be having uh, similar effects uh, to people that are exposed because as fires burn more acres in a world warmed by climate change, there's gonna be more intensity and velocity that's gonna be coming from all of these wildfires. And in this regards, we're gonna see, for example, in the United States, uh, when considering uh, some of the recent changes, uh, the intensity and velocity has been uh, in an upwards trend so far. And at least across America and very likely among the world, there is no safe distance from wildfire smoke. And much of this smoke, is just gonna circumnavigate the world before the rainy seasons. And just as we see from the current uh, levels uh, of smoke exposure, the extents of wildfires are gonna be reaching areas that weren't normally exposed to these uh, smoke exposures. And in this regard, the effects are still yet to be to be studied and considered specifically also for the most uh, disadvantaged uh, populations. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the PM2.5 are very tiny particles, but they're gonna have a very deep impact. Uh, just to do a comparison, usually when we consider human hair, uh, the length is about five to seven micrometers. But when we're considering uh, dust pollen, which is 10 micrometers, uh, to give a comparison, red blood cells are usually around seven micrometers. These combustion particles and organic compounds that are less than 2.5 micrometers are very small. And the short-term effects as we saw from the previous presentation are gonna be leading to very uh, different changes in the lungs but also these long-term effects as these particles translocate into the circulatory system, we're gonna start to see how the effects are gonna be involved in systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, which is gonna lead also to cardiovascular effects. And eventually also, as we saw, changes in the uh, CPG sites and DNA methylation that are gonna have uh, longer consequences and we need to be mindful about uh, all the things that could emerge uh, where we're exposed to higher levels of smoke and air pollution. I mean, the primary air pollutants from wildfire smoke, of course, there's uh, particulate matter, uh, but also there's going to be other elements that usually escape filtration systems like carbon monoxide, ozone, nitric dioxide, aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, VOCs. And also, uh, as one of the images show, uh, these little uh, suit balls that are also gonna be forming during the wildfires and they're gonna be worsened with climate change as we get exposed to uh, very different uh, quantities of smoke. And also when vehicles and buildings burn, there's also other elements that are being volatized and in, being integrated into the air pollutants as the wildfires uh, run rampant. The structural fire smoke contains toxic air contaminants that include uh, heavy metals, 
uh, fascines, also uh, other types of, of micro pollutants are gonna be present. And in this regard, we need to consider that the chemistry of smoke as it changed, it's not only a matter of, of what type of air pollution you're getting exposed, but also what's burning and the elements that are gonna be present there. So when considering the characteristics of control and wildfire exposure, we did a cohort study where we considered uh, people that were exposed to air pollution due to wildfire smoke. And we noticed that as wildfire, wildfire exposure increases, there's gonna be also increases in elements of the infanazone pathways. Uh, particularly within three or four days of exposure, we would see changes in uh, C-reactive protein, D-dimer, IL-18, IL-1-beta, Milloperoxidases, and this is just to show that some of the comparisons are, are going to be uh, very significant uh, in very different fat weights that are going to be leading to inflammation. So, what are the possible solutions? This is where discussions like this come in, and what are the things that we need to consider? Because with climate change, air pollution, and health, we need to first ask ourselves, how are we going to monitor the different changes? And I think when we're considering the exposome and the group that has been uh, doing these talks and presentations, I think it's uh, very essential to, to figure out what are the next steps while we consider uh, the lifestyle, the behaviors, the diet, the occupations, and do the analysis of all the things that are gonna be affecting us as individuals. It's not just one element that's interacting uh, with the immune system, and there are several elements. And, and I think this concept of the, of the exposome, uh, it's a very uh, holistic approach to, to seeing what is gonna be the types of, of analysis and considerations we need to do as far as, as looking into the mitigation and adaptation of the air pollution exposure in a currently environment that's being affected due to climate change. So we need to consider all of these exposure elements, while we also uh, consider the integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs. Because as we run into uh, the investment of uh, resilient environments, where we need to also consider how can we improve the current system in which we can have climate security, yeah, better food sources, better health, uh, clean water and energy, in order to also improve uh, this exposome and consider what are gonna be ways in which we can mitigate uh, the effects of air pollutants and climate change in the immune system. So I would like to also give shout outs and appreciation to all our wonderful collaborators at Stanford and around the world. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without uh, many, uh, many, uh, collaborators, partnerships, and people that are just interested in the topics we're passionate about and notice that this is something that we need to tackle together and work together if we want to uh, solve more of the pressing issues and get a little bit of a, a better understanding of what things can be done. So thank you so much for, for your time and I would like to open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, I have here one question in, in the Q&A. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, do you have an idea why the link uh, with prenatal air pollution was observed with diastolic but not with systolic air blood pressure? Yes, definitely. Uh, with blood pressure, uh, the Elements that control systolic and diastolic pressures are, are very different. Usually the systolic pressure, it's, it's mostly uh, has to do with the uh, resistance of the, of the arteries and blood vessels. So that usually has to do a lot with uh, more of the inflammation. But uh, the diastolic pressure, it's usually controlled by the circulating volume. And in this regard, when we're noticing that some of the effects on the immune system and the uh, uh, in, immune response are going to be also having an effect on uh, heart rate variability. Uh, it, it might be that the changes are, are mostly affecting uh, those types of, of reactions that are mostly related to the diastolic blood pressure rather than the systolic blood pressure. So 
uh, we were surprised as well to see that it just focused on one of the elements, but they do have a different nature. So uh, usually we use uh, blood pressure as, as a combined element, but there are many different uh, pathways that affect both of them. So I, I think it's very, very interesting to, to consider that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And yeah, uh, when you talk about uh, air pollution, you, you take into consideration both the particle uh, materials and the um, and the gases. Can you dissect out a little bit if, if, what is the worst, or is it really uh, the combination of the two that, that makes the, the larger effect? Yes, in this case, uh, the, the combination of the gases and the particles are definitely going to be leading to changes. It is very difficult to separate them because in the environment, uh, they're going to be uh, present in, in, in the different uh, exposures, uh, depending on the type of and nature of the exposure. If it's more related to traffic, we see more of a combination of smaller particles and gases. And when it's more like wildfire smoke, we tend to see more elements and, and larger particles. And we do see increasing symptoms, in, but in, in this regard, I think we need to to consider that people are going to be exposed to to these combinations, and in when we're looking at the immune responses, uh, looking at solutions that are going to be able to filter out most of these elements uh, are going to be key because it's going to be very unlikely that we find a population just exposed to a very particular type of gas or particle. So considering uh, the, the, the environment and, and the combinations, uh, it, it's an approach that, that we tend to do. However, we do see uh, differences in some of the associations and this is very important to, to consider. Uh, something interesting is that ozone tends to be uh, uh, secondary pollution that behaves a little bit different because of the interaction with nitrogen dioxide. So we tend to see the associations go in a different direction. Uh, however, uh, this doesn't mean that it's a protective effect. It just means that it reacts differently at different times. And the fact that it's associated with all these pollutants is something that why we still consider it as part of the models. Okay, thank you. I also see a hand raised by Niels Helens. To activate your microphone. Hello, Niels. Uh, we see your hand there, but you're muted. So, okay. So, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Uh, so, Juan, I had a question related to your your effects on T Rex and uh, T helper cells. So, is there any known mechanism? Is this a direct effect on on T cells, or is it through the the myeloid cells? Do you have any uh, insights on that? Right now, we're trying to, oh. to figure it out ourselves. Uh, some of the literature that we looked into in previous experiments have noticed that uh, some of the key changes come from the response of the uh, aryl hydrocarbon uh, receptors and the expression of, of certain markers that are going to lead to Treg expression. Uh, however, as we're starting to use uh, mass cytometry in order to discern a little bit more of the nature of the markers, uh, we're going to be going further down into the differences between uh, specific T helper cell uh, populations and also the T Rex. It seems that there's also certain responses that go into a subset of the T regulatory cells, which is the TR1s. So uh, we want to dive deeper into how these uh, differentiations. Uh, actually have a, a greater effects uh, related to the air pollution and, and climate. So we will definitely look into that. So thank you. And thank you, uh, Juan. Uh, so can you stop sharing your uh, slides? Um, because I think, unfortunately, we have to stop uh, our uh, discussion here. And then I can introduce uh, the next speaker who is, yeah one who just asked a question, Alex, uh, who is, and I cannot uh, get my slide shared, seems to be, yes, there I am. Um, so, 
Dr. Niels Hellings uh, had his PhD in immunology at uh, Hasselt University in Belgium. And his uh, research uh, is, is mainly on mechanistic uh, um, issues in neuroinflammation, repair and aging uh, at the largest and, and using uh, larger scale data. So, so uh, I will not uh, introduce too long so that you can have uh, enough time to uh, give uh, your talk. My mouse is hidden. So I stop sharing. Okay. So Neil, please uh, share your screen for your presentation, and I give you the floor. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the short introduction, and uh, I'm happy to share my passion with uh, for one of the uh, well, my research passions is on immune aging. Uh, it's a little bit maybe different than, than the two other talks, so I will not talk about uh, uh, pollutants and so on, but uh, probably this is also one of the triggers for immune aging. Uh, I will talk about other triggers, also how you can measure immune aging and what kind of interventions that are uh, available or not uh, to date. But let's first start off with this picture. And uh, becoming 100 years uh, a while ago was really something quite exceptional and, and spectacular uh, in this sense, even that the mayor came down to your house, brought your son cake. And then in the backside, you could already see the television cameras and you would for sure be one of the headlines in the evening news. But today um, in Belgium only, we already have 1,200 centenarians and actually projections show that um, every 10 years, the number of centenarians will double. So actually the centenarians by now are the fastest growing age category. Um, this is good news, of course, but it, it also comes with new problems. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, aging populations also lead to a steep increase in age related diseases. And then of course, we're thinking about dementia and Alzheimer, but also other chronic diseases like arthritis, heart disease, uh, diabetes, also more cancerous, COPD and so on. So a lot of research efforts are ongoing to really find out what are the key elements that will help us age successfully. Um, and some work from quite a while ago uh, from Dan Butler was already quite uh, enlightening. I don't know if you know Dan Butler, uh, Dan Butler, but he's one of the best-selling author, authors in the US. And that's mostly based on the fact that he identified the blue zones um, more, more or less 15 years ago. So what Dan Butner found out uh, together with uh, National Geographic, that there are five uh, regions or five communities in the world where there is a record number of centenarians. And those are in California, Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, and in Japan. So, and of course, he was pretty interested to find out what are the common denominators between those communities and how do they differ from the rest of the world. And basically, he came up with four uh, explanations. So one is that uh, the elderly in the blue zones, that they actually stay integral part of the family. So while we put our elderly in nursing homes, um, actually, and the blue zones, they are part of uh, the family still, and they will in this way keep their social network very strongly. A second uh, argument he found was that uh, the elderly always have a purpose in life. So they either never retire or when they retire, they're active in social work and so on. So they always have a reason to wake up in the morning again and again. Uh, and then two other uh, very important discriminator was for one diet. So if you look at the diet of these communities, they eat a lot of whole grains, they eat uh, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, almost no meat and uh, for sure no processed uh, foods. Uh, and then the fourth and, and, and last but not least, the fourth, fourth one is to move naturally, to be active all the time. So people in the blue zones, they walk to work, they don't take the car. And for instance, they take the stairs because there are no elevators where they're working or where they're being active. Uh, and of course, I was quite intrigued by this work of Dan Butner, but I also felt that they overlooked something. And of course, this is the immune system. So, so 
I think the immune system is also very important to successfully age. And this, this is one of the main themes in my research group. So we're looking at the immune system and health and disease, uh, looking at uh, chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, but also acute diseases like spinal cord injury, uh, looking at changes in the immune system, whether the, the, the functionality of the immune system changes. But as such, we're also interested in how the immune system just changes because of aging. Um, and so this brings me to the, the overview of my, my lecture. Uh, so I will touch briefly upon what factors shape the immune system and then go into immunosenescence, what it really is, what are potential triggers there, how can we measure immunosenescence, and then discuss a little bit about whether we are able to stop immunosenescence or even reverse. Um, but let's first look at what factors shape the immune system. And of course, if you're born, you're being exposed to a lot of external threats. And of course, this includes pollution, topic of today, but also microorganisms. And also when you're just born, you will be vaccinated pretty soon. And all these external immune challenges will lead to changes in your immune system. Uh, for instance, the regulatory T cells that are really high when you're still a fetus, to, to provide maternal tolerance, they will start to decline. Your naive T cells, because of the exposure to all the microorganisms and all the other external threats, will start to form memory T cells. And the same goes for B cells. So B cells will form memory plasma cells. Um, and this is a general concept. You can find that back in, in, uh, in textbooks of immunology. But some nice work of, of Adrian Liston and, and collaborators showed that if you look at the human immune variation at the population level, it's very diverse. But if you look within one person, within one individual, the way one person reacts to a certain immune challenge is rather stable throughout life. Although another person could completely react differently to an immune threat, uh, within the person, it's really stable. Uh, also, this work showed, and, and also some literary re uh, review showed, that actually the, the human, the variation in the human immune system is only explained for 20 to 40 percent by genetic variation. So this leaves 60 to 80 percent of remaining contributors to immune variation. Uh, and I won't have too much detail to go into that, but there are, of course, extrinsic factors, um, but also intrinsic factors. And one of those is aging. So let's look at what really, what we mean with immune aging. So immune aging is an age-dependent decrease in the, in the immunological competence. Um, and this is not defined by time, but by expected lifespan of a species. For instance, on this slide, you can see the bowhead whale, which has a life expectancy of 200 years. And it has been shown that Im uh, immunosenescence really is much slower in bowhead whales compared to, for instance, uh, humans. This immune competence loss, of course, leads to certain problems. Uh, people, elderly people, uh, elderly individuals will have an increased susceptibility to infections, to cancer, and also a decreased vaccine efficiency. So let's dive into a little bit more into the immune aging process and more specifically into what happens with T cells. So T cells will start to age at a certain uh, age because there is this process called thymic involution. Your thymus will start to shrink already at an age of 17 years of age. So, uh, and if you look at the, at the uh, right graph, you can see actually at the age of 40, you already have a completely, uh, uh, your, your, your functional tissue of your thymus has completely been replaced by adipose tissue. And at that stage, um, you have a quite steep decline in the production of naive new T cells because that's the function of the thymus. It's producing naive T cells all the time. Um, but to keep the T cell numbers steady, uh, the existing T cells, they will start to homeostatically proliferate. And in this way, you can keep the level of your T cells and your diversity at a certain uh, level. 
But of course, the older you get, the more uh, prominent you get this proliferation and certain T cell clonotypes will start to expand more than others and will then also suppress the other uh, T cells. And this really leads to like a scarcity of your T cell repertoire and eventually to senescent T cells. Um, senescent T cells are uh, characterized by the loss of CD20H, which is a co-stimulatory molecule. And this is caused by proliferative stress and also by chronic antigen stimulation. And what we do see uh, also for CD4 T cells, which are according to the textbooks, T helper cells, that they also acquire cytotoxic activities, although they are CD4 T cells. Um, and we think that those cells are a, a, a hallmark of senescent T cells, which could also contribute to certain diseases. And I must say for the completeness of my talk that uh, immunosenescence is not only limited to T cells, but also to B lymphocytes. So you also get a reduced development of, of the number of naive B cells. And also the cells of the innate immune system are at a certain stage impaired. For instance, they decrease their phag phagocytic capacity, decrease their defense mechanisms, and so on. But I must again stress, so immunosenescence is something that's happening in everyone, but it, there is quite some evidence that the, the, the pace in which this happens in an individual could be really different. And there are some accelerating factors, and one of those are chronic infections. A lot of viruses, a lot of bacteria we can clear from our system because we are able to really mount a very strong, efficient immune response with that. But then you have, for instance, those herpes viruses. Uh, and one of the herpes viruses we, we worked on a lot is cytomegalovirus, virus. And those viruses have mechanisms to really um, mislead the immune system. And this way you will never get rid of your uh, herpes viruses. And what we have shown, if you look at the, at the left graph, what we have shown is that the senescent T cells, so, so CD4, CD20, and the null T cells, that they really expand a lot in those patients that acquire CMV, while they're actually not expanded in CMV negative persons. And this is an ongoing vicious circle where the older you get, the more your inward T cell compartment will try to deal with those uh, herpes viruses. And at the end, uh, there is an increased susceptibility for the activation of T cells, including autoimmune T cells that could predispose you to develop chronic diseases. So the other trigger we believe that is important in an accelerated immune aging is autoimmunity. So those are our family of diseases where the immune system mistakenly reacts to your own tissues. And one of the, the major diseases in our laboratory that is uh, investigated is multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, what we have shown again for the CD4, CD28 null T cells, when you compare it with healthy controls, um, that there are more people that have expanded CD4, CD28 need T cells when they acquire uh, autoimmune disease, such as arthritis, but also multiple sclerosis. But what does this really mean, the expansion of those cells? Well, at least for MS, we have shown that they are really pathogenic and could drive disease progression. Uh, so again, what you can see in the left top uh, panel is that indeed you do get expansions of these CD4, CD28 null T cells and CMV positive donors, independent whether they're MS patients or healthy controls. And we have shown in post-mortem tissue of MS patients that you can find those highly cytotoxic T cells back in close proximity with oligodendrocytes and myelinated axons, suggesting that they could contribute to breakdown of myelin, which is one of the hallmarks of MS. We also tested whether we could use the percentage of CD4, CD28 null T cells as a measure, as a biomarker to predict worse disease progression. And that's what you can see at the right panel. What we did is measure the percentage of CD4, CD28 null T cells, and then looked at progression five years onward. And what you can nicely see that, that there is a strong correlation between the baseline numbers of those cytotoxic T cells and the consequent progression, either looking at the EDSS score, which is a clinical composite score in MS, 
or at the evoked potentials, which are a measure for uh, nerve conduction in patients. And again, this agent is not limited only to T cells. So other work in our institute showed that uh, also in the B cell compartment, there is an age inappropriate expansion of aging B cells. Uh, um, and this is based on double negative B cells. So B cells that are negative for IgD and uh, CD27, uh, but also CD21 low B cells that have been shown to be uh, aged in other disease indications. Okay, so, and then I come to the topic. So how can you really measure immunosenescence? And this is really still something very difficult because immunosenescence is a natural process. So it's always difficult to see whether this is pathological immune aging or normal immune aging. But at least what I have shown you already is that you could look at the increase of age associated immune cells by flow cytometry. You could look at uh, lymphocyte diversity, just look at the T cell and or B cell receptor repertoire with sequencing or with spectrotyping. Of course, you can also look at shortening of telomeres in T cells, uh, but there's quite some telomer activity, telomerase activity still in T cells. So it's not a very good market to really look at senescence in T cells. And then another marker that's sometimes used is the formation of tracks. And these are T cell receptor excision circles. And these are produced during normal development of T cells. So a young T cells has a lot of track numbers, while if a T cell is activated, and for sure if it's chronically activated, it's decreasing the number of tracks in the cell. Uh, in recent work, we also wanted to find out whether autoantibodies could be used as biomarkers for immune aging. And one of the biomarkers we looked at were antibodies to SPAC-16. And SPAC-16 is a sperm-associated antigen, and it has been shown to be uh, significantly increased in MS patients compared to healthy donors. So we wanted to find out whether this is also something we see in normal aging or in chronic uh, immune aging. And these are some preliminary data there. And what you can see here during natural immune aging, the amount of, of donors that are seropositive for this anti spark antibodies really increases if you compare 55 above uh, uh, population compared to, to the 55 uh, below population. And if you then look at asthma, you can also see that if you take uh, a pairwise comparison of age-matched groups, that again, there is a, a, a faster increase in this autoantibody marker in asthma patients compared to healthy controls. It's still ongoing work, so we're still working on that to further uh, establish this as a biomarker for immune aging. And then, of course, another very important question, can we do something about immunosenescence? Can we really rejuvenate the immune system and in this way also keep people uh, healthy and, and help them to successfully uh, age? And of course, this is a very difficult thing. Actually, the only thing that has been really been firmly proven is that caloric restriction, and it's only proven in animals, could really also prolong the fitness of the immune system in animals and even uh, the lifespan of those animals. Um, of course, in humans, caloric restriction is something that's really uh, tricky, especially related to uh, treatment adherence, but also it could come with uh, severe side effects. Um, so there are many other ways to look at that uh, to see whether you can really keep your immune system fit. Of course, you have anti-aging compounds, and then we think about there are some studies ongoing with metformin or rapamycin, also synolytics. These are compounds that, that uh, are there to promote apoptosis of your senescent cells, including your, your senescent immune cells. Another way about it could be to, to work with cytokine therapy, for instance, interleukin-7 is something that has been known to expand CD4 and CD8 T cells. Some stem cell approaches trying to uh, regenerate thymic tissue, nutraceuticals. And I think really related to our work, I think it could, should be considered that maybe CMV vaccination could also prevent the accelerated immune aging that we see uh, both in healthy donors as well as in autoimmune disease patients. 
Um, and there are also other ways. Uh, so you have the, let's say, the more medical interventions, but you also have training. I think about what Dan uh, Butner told us, that being active every day is pretty important for a healthy life. Uh, and we have now an ongoing study where we're looking at elderly to, to have them more active. Uh, and why we want to do this is because we know that activated muscles will produce myokines. And myokines are kind of cytokine. You can even see like the classical cytokines, including IL-6, IL-7, and IL-15. And there's quite some literature showing that those cytokines can promote the immune fitness, can even have an effect on your timic output, uh, can further stimulate your memory T cells. Um, and we believe if we find the right interventions, the right activity uh, programs for elderly, that we will be able to prolong the immune fitness in the elderly. So um, one last remark before I have my take home messages. Um, of course, if we're looking at immune aging, we're always looking at inflammation, at immunosenescence and so on. But it's not this black and white like always. So I think um, it could well be that the processes that change during your aging uh, life, that this is more like an optimization. So you, you need other responses when you age. So it could be more an immunoadaptation than really something that's bad. But then, of course, it's really important that the inflammation that's ongoing uh, is also counterbalanced by anti-inflammation things. So this is really a call to say that don't only look at the bad things happening in the immune system, but for sure also measure all the anti-inflammatory uh, profiles. And, it, and, and it, at least in centenarius, it has been shown that people that are over 100 years of age, they have very high levels of IL-6, but they also have very high levels of anti-inflammatory agents. So in this way, this inflammation as such is not really bad for those people because you have a nice counterbalance of anti-inflammation effects. So my take home messages are that immune aging reshapes the immune functionality, that both exogenous and endogenous sources steer immune aging. So far, we don't have a unified biomarker panel to measure immune physics. There are some good markers around, but probably you would need a composite uh, panel to really know what's going on. And still, it's very difficult to discriminate be between normal and pathological immune aging. And so far, although there is quite some interesting research ongoing, there is no evidence that immune aging can really be reversed in humans. I do believe there is, by intervening with lifestyle measures and maybe with some uh, uh, medical interventions, that there is a way to slow down immune aging. And this is my last slide showing the people that contributed to the work with the final uh, support, financial support. So I am now ready for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice for me introduction in this immune senescence. Um, I've got here one question in, in the Q&A from Michel Pusquin. Uh, so very nice presentation. Uh, different immune cells uh, have different epigenetic signature. Uh, what is the role of epigenetic aging in immune cells? Um, would it be different immune cells having different epigenetic aging patterns or, or something, or, or uh, does it uh, happen uniformly? Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Michelle, for this question. It's, it's not an easy one to answer, um, but of course, if you look, for instance, at the innate immune system, where previously we as if we teach immunology, we say that uh, uh, innate uh, immunity doesn't have memory, it has been shown that, that there is memory, uh, it's called trained immunity. And for sure, there's quite some evidence that epigenetic changes are important. Also in aging individuals, you see that there is a decrease in, in the response of, of myeloid cells to, for instance, DLR triggers to um, um, phagocytosis and so on. And these are really permanent things. So there's not a lot you can do still with that. So it really shows that those changes probably are steered by the constant exposure to all the environmental triggers. Um, but I, I'm, I, for sure, this will also happen in the adaptive immune system. Um, 
just uh, uh, another question, bit in line, although different. So, so you gave a, a nice example of uh, uh, a chronic infection leading to, to senescence or uh, uh, at least uh, helping it, it to, to, to uh, become faster. Uh, um, but are there good examples from general environmental exposures leading to that? Because that is also often uh, leading to chronic in inflammations and so on. So, so maybe that is really something for, for yeah, projects like ours uh, in, in, yeah. in human exposure, environmental exposures to, to, to use the, the tools you, you show and uh, whether or not uh, the senescence is really also linked to, to chronic exposures. Yeah, so I, I'm I, I'm not into that part of the literature, so maybe Juan can can fill me in on that. But um, for sure, it could be interesting to also look at that eh, and to see whether there is indeed uh, accelerated immune aging in people that are highly exposed to to pollutants. Uh, but I, I, again, so it's not my field of research, so so I, I don't know if Juan is still here to to help me out with that, but uh, he still is. But uh, yeah. It is, yeah. I'm still here, Niels, yeah, uh, I, okay. and I think it's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so familiar with the epigenetic changes per mm -hmm. se that have to do with aging, but it's definitely something we're considering. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we can look further into the literature and, and maybe mm -hmm. answer that question uh, later in a follow-up email, because yeah. I think it, it's very interesting to consider uh, yeah. those changes as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, for... uh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, what I also think is a very interesting uh, point to look at and also maybe in our samples to look at signals, uh, whether or not we, we can pick this up very well. Uh, I don't see any additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so that then brings me to maybe uh, to finalize and wrap up uh, this, this um, symposium. So I think we had uh, a very nice uh, overview of different aspects of the aging uh, and, and uh, immune system linked to yeah, different uh, triggers um, by both Niels or by all three, uh, Niels, Joan and Tobias and, and different aspects. So I thank you for, for these very interesting uh, presentations. I also thank the audience uh, being here. It's always difficult uh, to have a touch with the audience because we are working online. And today it was a difficult uh, session online because I, I, ha I had to move because there is something wrong with the um, internet in, at my desk, uh, and also Tobias had quite some, some difficulties. Uh, but yeah, let's hope next time it will run better. And I certainly need to thank uh, Katrin and Manosic. And Manosic really uh, did a good job uh, when I was out uh, over uh, the chair. And I certainly have to say, uh, Thanks to all Exemius partners because we tried to work all together uh, in, in this project, uh, getting a uh, better view on immune related issues due to exposures. And you see all the partners here. And just the last points uh, I've got this PS down uh, at, at my slide. So please do not forget to fill the feedback survey when you log out or try to log out from, from this uh, uh, session. So I see there is something in the chat uh, uh, still there. Uh, try to read that. So yeah, I also see thanks there. I don't at different points. So so yeah. So I can think close the session. Thank you again, uh, all speakers, Tobias, Juan, and, and Niels. And hopefully, I see you as an audience uh, next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Peter.